Hi guys, and welcome to a new introduction to our tutorial, updated from, oh gosh, five years ago when we first started this adventure. And this video is meant to supplement my structural equation modeling class, but it really could be for anybody who's interested in kind of a brief intro to R. And at the very end, I'll show you there are some cool tutorials that you can do in R. Okay, so let's get started. I always like to start with this overall note that you can learn. Coding can be hard, but you can learn. And you will get frustrated. I get frustrated, and I've been doing this for longer than I realize. And so there are definitely days, including today, that I have written something that didn't work. So that's okay. You'll also get errors that don't make sense and aren't helpful. As you get better at doing this sort of thing, it gets easier to understand how to backtrack the error and see what the problem really is. So Google is your friend. If you get stuck, best thing to do is Google that specific error message first. Sometimes those error messages are vague. X is not numeric is one of my favorites. Then try Googling that specific function and your error message. So let's say you used LM and then X is not numeric. So that you can start to maybe p whittle down into the specific package that you're using. Um, then just try a bunch of different search terms. So I don't know that I would say I'm good at debugging, I'm just good at Googling. So a couple helpful websites to get you started. Um, there's a quick R website from um, statmethods.net. R's documentation website is actually pretty good depending on the package. Some of them are more well documented than others. Swirl Stats is one of my absolute favorites. They actually have built-in tutorials as well that you can take while you're learning in R. Um, what I am doing is also supplementing uh, my particular course that I'm teaching right now with Learn R tutorials, which has a similar feel to Swirl, but is a bit more interactive. Uh, Stack Overflow is your friend. You'll get annoyed by people's comments sometimes, uh, but it's definitely one of the best websites to help find answers to questions. And then learning statistics with R is a really great um, stats focused uh, coding website run by Danny Navarro and it is just amazing. <laughs> I, I used it when I was learning how to convert my graduate statistics course over into R and R Studio. So really great stuff. Now to get started, what you'll need is R. Okay, first thing you want to download, and you can get that from CRAN, and uh, it will just depend, but our current version as of November 2020 is 4.0. You'll also need XQuartz if you're running an older version of Mac. The newer versions of Mac or the newer um, operating systems come with XQuartz, but I find I still have some students who for some reason never update their computers, and so you might need that. It's part of the uh, plotting software and necessary to make graphs for R and lots of things, but XQuartz is your friend. You'll also need RStudio. RStudio is a IDE or integrated development environment, and it really just makes all of this so much easier. Uh, there are other IDEs for R, but I would say by far most folks like RStudio. I have found that they're really uh, responsive to our community and have um, implemented a bunch of exciting things to help coding become easier. I'm currently excited for RStudio 1.4 that has color coded uh, square, uh, brackets to help you know when you've opened and closed different brackets. So, you know, that's probably me being a nerd, but um, I would say that definitely has always made it easier to, to work. If you want to use just regular R, you can download it um, and actually type directly into R. But then half of this uh, video isn't for you. So what we're going to cover in this lecture, and I'm trying not to drone on forever, is commands. Like, what is coding and how do I command things and make the computer do what I want? Right? Object types, which I argue are the, the main conceptual confusion for students who are first learning a language 
And I probably learned three or four languages before I totally understood that this was like a key concept that really allowed me to map from one to another. And so this is just like, what is saved? What do I have open and what can I do with those things? So we'll talk about what are object types and what can object types be in R. Subsetting, which is really important on grabbing only the data that you're interested in, um, doing things to only part of the data. So how do I grab just pieces of the, the data that I'm interested in? Okay. Missing data, which in a statistics focused course is key to understand. Working directories, which is going to help you open, save, run files that are not embedded in R. Uh, packages, which are add-ons and functions. So obviously this is not going to be a complete tutorial and you will obviously need to practice, but this is kind of the, the outline of what we're going to work through. Okay. So let's jump in. Commands. What is a command? A command is the code. Commands are the code, is the code, is the magic, right? That you tell R what you want to do. Okay. And that can be really simple, like x equals 4 or they can be quite complex. Now, computers do what you tell them to do. So mistakes happen. I don't tend to live code very often because I can't spell. And that is often the number one mistake that people make. You type something, you've misspelled it. And so it'll tell you, I can't find that variable. And you're like, but I just made the variable. And you might have it misspelled. And so maybe it's a typo when something doesn't work quite right, or maybe it's a misunderstanding of what the code does. So I found the longer I go, the less typos, depends on the day, right? The less typos I make, but I still still work through an understanding of like, what am I supposed to put in this spot? Right? Because as you'll see it towards the end of this set of videos is that there are specific spots to put things. And sometimes you put the wrong thing in that spot and that's when the code doesn't work like you think it should. And so let's look at a simple command. First one might be x equals 4. So this is how one might type x equals 4 in R. So anytime you see a gray box across here, this is going to be code that's being typed. I am using um, a special set of slides that runs the code and shows you the output. Okay, and we'll look at that a little bit more in a minute. Okay. So I can type, type commands directly into what's called the console, and we'll look at that in a second. I can also type code um, or commands into an R script or an R markdown document. And there's even more, but we'll focus on those two and then tell it to run in the console. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing that the console is where all of the scripting happens, all of the code running, but I could separate those two things out. And the reason you do that is because you wanna save this code. Why type it over and over again? So scripts and markdown documents allow me to save what I'm doing and run it again later. If I type directly into the console, it's going to go away when I close the program. Okay. So I've got x equals 4 here, and that's just an example of a simple command. Okay. So in the command window, which we'll look at in just, or the console window, which we'll look at in just a second, you might see this um, greater than sign. Okay. That indicates that it's ready for more code. It's like, I'm ready, do something. The plus sign indicates that you haven't finished a code section or block. And often this means you forgot to close a parentheses, which you'll see in a little bit, close a curly bracket, mistype something. You haven't finished. It's expecting there to be more code and it's not getting it. If you are like, uh, I was done, what's going on? You can always hit the escape key to cancel out what you've currently done and kind of back up and work some more. Capitalization and symbols do matter. So if you spell something in uppercase, it only knows that that variable in uppercase. So you have to be careful to the way you spell things. Um, and if you add a symbol like an underscore, okay, or a dot, those symbols matter, they have to stay. The equal sign and the less than dash are equivalent. You'll see most tutorials and most teachers use this a kind of assignment operator, which would be this one in their code, but you can actually use equals. 
and I've done it both ways for many years and I switch back and forth and it hasn't ever caused me any issues. And so I think I try to be good when I'm writing tutorials and code now and use the assignment operator. So it's all, you know, looks nice. Uh, but if you want to use equals, that's actually one less thing to type. <laughs> so it's actually a little faster maybe. If you are working in R Studio, you can hit the up arrow key and scroll through the commands that you've currently run. So if you want to run another one again, you can kind of back up and see what's happening. And I love the tab key option, which is as I'm typing, I can get a list of things um, that match what I'm typing. So R Studio has kind of a regular expressions in the background that looks at what's currently open, what you can currently use, and kind of tells you here are your options. So the tab key is your friend. Okay. Those last two are, I think actually, just the last one's particular to R Studio, but I haven't coded in just plain old R in a long time. So it might do both of those as well. You can use the question mark followed by a specific command or function name to learn more about it. And we'll do that in the function section so you can see what that looks like. And there's many more hints and tips and tricks in our studio, the company puts out these really great cheat sheets if you want to look at those. So let's take a look at and just kind of run some simple commands to get started. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to kind of move my notes over and look at our studio. Okay. So I actually have these lecture notes open. <laughs> And you can see that I've written them in what's called a markdown document. Now, if this is the first time that you've ever used RStudio, yours will look a little different. So let me show you how yours will look. So this is the base setup for RStudio when you have um, first opened it. So that file won't even be open. And so what happens is the first thing I want to talk about is where's the console. Okay, so the console is going to be at the bottom left. I really like mine on the bottom right, and you'll see why in a minute. So I'm going to move it back. <laughs> but this is the console. So when it first opens, it prints out a little bit of like what version of R you're using. So I'm using one of the newest ones. I think it's 4.0.3 is actually the newest one, but close enough. Um, and this is where I could type my commands. Okay, so I could say x equals 4. Now, that console is where your code runs. Okay. And so if you download just R, that's what's running. Okay, it's just this console window. And you don't get any of the extra um, pieces here that's available in RStudio. So this is what I like about RStudio because there's so much more that it adds on top of R. So it's running the R console in the background. Okay. Not even the background, right here in the foreground. Okay. The other thing that it adds is a couple of extra windows, terminal, um, I have our markdown tab because I had opened a markdown document and jobs. We're mostly going to ignore these three as they are things that are important as you get more involved in R, but these are extra tabs that are part of the console block. I'm going to move mine around. <laughs> so the reason I have mine set up differently is because I like to see the console next to the script instead of below the script. And so you can do that by clicking on this four panes button and then click pane layout and I'm just going to switch mine. Now this is personal preference. So obviously you can do this in whatever order you like, but the other cool thing is this is where you can do all of the different colors if you wanted to change. I don't even know. I, I don't, I want to stick with whatever I had <laughs> there. How about Chrome? Okay. Hit apply and okay. So there's a ton of stuff that you can do there. So now I've got my console on the right. How do you run code? Well, I can run code by just typing it in the console. So I already did x equals 4. Let's do y. And I'm just going to use the regular old equals this time, equals 3. I'll also make this a little bit bigger. Um, and so I've just typed it directly in. So you notice that I have the um, greater than symbol here, which means that it's ready. Let's show, let me show you something that's not ready, maybe. Uh, wait. Wait by miles per gallon. And then I... Okay, forgot to close my parentheses. 
Okay, so now I've got this plus symbol that means you aren't you aren't done. What are you doing? Why aren't you finished? And so I could close that and it ran the function for me. If you are stuck and you don't know really how to fix it, just hit escape. Other way that you can run code is in a script window. So it did actually open me a script window, but let's say we don't have that open. We can click the little plus here and start a script. Okay. Script files are labeled .r and we can run code from them directly. Now to run that, um, what I did, sorry, old habits, is in on a Mac, it's Command or the Apple key and Enter. Okay. On Windows, I think it's Control Enter. And on Mac, you actually can use the Windows Control key as well. <laughs> but I would like to think of it as I have Control and I say Enter and I say Go, basically. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to highlight the code and click Run. Okay. I find new students do this a lot where they highlight and they run, but whatever line you are on, whatever line your cursor is on, if you hit Command Enter or Control Enter, it will actually run that line. Okay. And so if you have a lot of code, you can just start getting faster at it. So Command Enter, Command Enter, Command Enter. Okay. I am a Mac person, sorry, it's Control Enter. You can use the Run option though. I just find it tedious to highlight the code and hit Run, but personal preference. Now the nice thing about script files is that they can be run in other places. Um, I can save that script and I don't have to remember that I set it to five. I can put a bunch of code in here to use later. There are some really cool ways to do um, sections of scripts. So a shortcut is uh, control or command shift R. And I can label a section so you can separate your code into different blocks if you'd like. Uh, I personally like markdown documents better, but that's because of what I do as an academic. So that leads me to the question, what is a markdown document? Now we can start a whole new markdown document by clicking the down arrow here and click markdown. Okay. We can do this, it's a little intimidating because there are lots of types of markdown documents. Document is easily the most simple where you can write um, text and code in the same document and compile that into a report. If you're doing this, I recommend HTML because uh, HTML is universal, and so I can um, I don't need to have Office or OpenOffice installed. And PDF does require a, a bunch of other steps, um, so you have to install tech, okay. which isn't hard. It's just a big old thing to install, <laughs> several gigabytes. Okay. It also allows you to make slides, which is what I'm using here, uh, shiny apps, and then also templates. So I have um, some templates installed for the really great Papaya package, which lets me write my like scientific articles completely in RStudio. Uh, anyways, so document's probably the easiest one. Click OK, kind of presets it up for you. Okay. And so in a Markdown document, we have text. Okay. And Markdown is a specific way to kind of write and format stylistically. And it has like a little guide here on how to write Markdown. Um, and then you have code. So I can run code within this document and create a compiled report. Okay. So I'm not going to hit knit because um, I have one of these compiled reports already open, my slides. But the reason, the way my slides were made was by hitting this knit button. Okay. And I have a bunch of other tutorials on Markdown specifically if you're interested. But basically, this lecture set here that we're looking at was made in a markdown document. Okay, it's just a specific one that does slides. And so we're actually right here. Oh, nope, nope, sorry, I lied to you. Right here in this set of documents. Okay, so scripts, just code. Markdown documents, code and text. Okay, that's all you need to know. If I am in this though, I take the same procedure to run code, control enter. Or magically, I can hit the little green button and it'll run the whole box. This is my favorite button though. Run everything above this and then run this box. Okay. And so this is really nice because I can tell it to kind of run all of the pieces above it, and they're called chunks, and then run the box. Or I can run the line one at a time, control enter. Okay. All right, cut to that spot. So back to the slides here. We've done all of these things. 
Oh, okay, what are all the windows in our studio? Well, we'll come back to it. We have the working area, which is things like our current files that are open, the scripts and the markdown. So let's go look at that. And so this is what I'm calling the working area here, my top left. Usually it's the top left for everyone. What do they actually call it? Source, okay, so the source area. But this is where you might have things like a script open. Our console window, which I moved over here to the right, which runs most of the code, okay, and then has some other options. So Markdown, when I knitted this document, it showed me how it compiled into the slides that I have open. Okay. And when this don't run, and <laughs> there's an error message, this is where it'll show up. Um, terminal, which is kind of, it is literally a terminal. If you're a Windows user, this is the command prompt. And jobs is a really cool function where I can run specific scripts that might take a long time. So I can tell it to run and keep working. So it runs in a separate kind of R window. The environment history connections box. Okay, this will depend on what you have open, what you'll see down here. So I can see tutorial because I have a specific tutorial package installed called Learn R. And the environment window is really, really great. And so what it shows me is what variables I have. So the environment window allows me to see what's saved in what's called the working environment. Okay, and this is just literally what variables are open. And so we'll go over what possibly could be present here in the environment window. But this is um, really where a lot of people learn. So you can import data sets, you can broom. Um, what was our phrase one year, when in doubt, broom it out. So if you're having trouble, clear everything out. Um, this just shows you what you have open. So you might have a bunch of data sets open and we'll come back to looking at like how this works in a little bit. The history is literally just the last things that you've run. I don't use this too much, but if you're trying to find something specific, you can see that it has stored a bunch of what I have run. And I think if you click on a line, you can actually send it to the console or send it to your code where you're typing in your source window, which I don't really actually want to do. Uh, tutorial here is a set of tutorials from the Learn R package. So if you're uh, learning, they have some really great tutorials on how to filter things, how to create new variables, summarize tables, that kind of stuff. Files, this one over here shows me where my current files are. So I'm like where this file is saved on my computer. Plots is a really great window when we make a plot. So let's just make a quick plot here. That will print out here. You can blow them up, right click and save them. Packages, we're going to talk about a lot more, but this is where we'll add on to our um, uh, options in R. Okay. The help window we'll also talk about a lot more. And then the viewer window, which I don't, is for um, like slides and these tutorials and stuff. Okay. It's, it's separate from plots. Plots is mostly any kind of graphic that you might make. All right. So we've covered this slide. So let's finish this lecture out with object types, and then we'll move on to um, a second video on some of the other things that we've talked about. Okay, so I wanna cover object types in this one because it's like one of the key pieces. So this is where we're really gonna get started. Okay, so here are some of the basics. Okay. In R specifically, so in other languages, there is other terminology. So I also teach Python to students, and we talk to students who are usually familiar with R, and we also talk about kind of the compare and contrast the different names for these. So if you know another language, they may not be, they may have the same name and not be the same thing. <laughs> so just a warning. Okay. So vectors are one of the most common types of variables. Okay. Lists, matrices, data frames, and then I don't know why that says object type. So again, um, okay. So that's an extra line. So here's the cool thing about markdown documents is if you have a line you don't need, you just take it out and recreate the entire document. Yep. 
And now you'll see there's no double object types. So this is one reason why I really like Markdown, right? And, and working with scripts. This is I've saved all that, I don't have to retype it all. So within these main types of objects we're gonna talk about here, values within those objects, within these variables here. So I'm gonna use object, meaning any kind of variable that I have saved. Variable, I feel like it's a more common way to call it, but any kind of object here. They can be of these four types, and there are others, but these are kind of the big four. Um, within those, what is saved in them, those values can be characters, factor, which is a special type of character, numeric, meaning the decimals, an integer, meaning a whole number usually, or a complex number, uh, a logical, so it's true or false, okay, kind of like uh, binary, zero and one, uh, or not a number. So sometimes you'll see NAN and people think that's missing data and that is actually not a number, which is usually happens when you try to divide by zero or something that just mathematically does not work. Okay. NA is a missing data point. And objects can also have attributes, sometimes called names. So the column name in a, if you're using like Excel, the first row, right, our column name, that's an attribute in R. Okay. And there are lots of different types of attributes. So I just wanted to show you an example so you can kind of get visually, uh, maybe get some understanding. Okay. And I'm going to use the Palmer Penguins library here. So we haven't got to what library means yet, but we will in a second. And so I've just opened some data. So pretend like I've opened this kind of an Excel. And what I've done is said, you know what, show me the attributes. Okay. It has a list of names. Those are the column names in this data set. It actually has a list of row names, but the row names are, are count, one, two, three, four. So the row names go up to 344, so they're 344 rows, but our rows could have names like Bob, Mary Sue. Okay. And it has a class. So class is the type of object that this is. Okay. And so this object is a data frame, but it's actually what's called a tibble. So tibbles are data frames that have some extra information. So you'll see these table, df, table. Okay, so um, these specifically, when you see these three in combination, it's called a tibble. The other cool function that we can run is str for structure. And when you run this, it gives you a little bit more information. And so it says, well, this is a tibble. Okay, so it specifically tells me that it's not just a data frame, it's a special type of tidyverse um, data set called a tibble. And the nice thing is then it shows me what all is in it. So these are the column names. Okay? And then I can actually see what's in that um, column. So this first one is a factor, which is again, this type of object um, or type of value within this data frame object. Okay? And it's got three levels. Okay? This one island is a factor with three levels. Bill length, because it's about penguins, is a number. This one's a number, but notice this next flipper length one is an integer, meaning it's a whole number. Okay. Sex here is a factor, and year here is an integer. So I can see kind of the list of the different um, columns and what's in those columns. Okay. Another option is names. So we've got attributes, structure, and names. So these are three ways to kind of learn what e an object is. And when you are getting some weird error messages, this really can help because it might say X is not numeric. And then you can t say, well, okay, tell me what X is. So I can use structure or the class function to show me what X is. Okay. And the names function gives me usually column names. Now you can do all of this actually within R as well. So I've run up to that point. And now I want to do is I can look at my penguins here. They're in my data set. I can click this little down arrow and see all that same thing. Okay. And so that what is saved up here in the data uh, environment window is actually the str function. So when we run that code, we get the same thing that this shows. But the nice thing about using RStudio is I can click on it and see it. And this is a really very handy um, in the sense that visual sometimes helps a lot of people. 
And so I, even though I almost never look at the environment anymore, um, I still use the view function to see what's happening. So you can see it ran this code over here. Okay. View is a special function. It's one of the only ones in basic R that's capitalized. And it is the much consternation of me, my typing skills. Okay. But now I can see what all is in the data set. I can sort, you can actually filter the data. So let's say I only want to look at girl penguins okay, um, who are on Dream Island. And so this is handy if you're first transitioning and even if you've been using this for a while. Okay, so let's get into making a vector. <clears throat> So a vector can be thought about as like one row or one column of data. Okay? And that could be one item, that could be several items, but it's only one row. It is not a dimensional data set. Okay, so it's not multiple columns or multiple rows. All of the objects have to be of the same class, meaning they all have to be characters, they all have to be integers, they all have to be logical. You cannot mix and match. If you try to mix and match, it will what's called coercion or coerce them into the same type. So if you try to make a bunch of characters into numbers, it doesn't like that because characters aren't numbers unless they're the number one. Okay. And so it'll actually make them a missing value if you try to convert, let's say the number one here into, I'm sorry, the word one into a number. Okay. And so I can show you that actually. I have, let's just say, the word one. Okay, that's a character. So it's okay, great. That's a vector. It has one item in it. If I tried to make that numeric, and you don't have to know this code just yet, I have it in a later slide. It goes, yeah, no, I don't like that so much. And so you'll see this in a, it's introduced by coercion. And all that means is that you try to convert from one class type to another, and it didn't work. All right, so I've got two examples here. Printed out X, had X stored earlier. It's a vector with one, one item in it. Now, um, the little one here indicates that it's, the, fir it's the, the first item for each printed row. So this here, it only has one item, so this is item number one. But I printed out the species column of the penguins data set, so that's one column or one row. And now you can see how this actually works. So the number in the brackets here indicates which item it is. So this is the first item, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. This is the eighth item. Okay. So just to mark what number that item is for the first one printed on that row. And this is an important spot to mention that R is a one index language. If you are familiar with more computer programming languages, Python, C++, Perl, uh, those are zero index languages, okay? meaning the first item in, the, in any set of items is zeroth item. Okay? In R, it starts with the one. And the way people feel about this, honestly, in whatever language you learn first, I get it both ways. I personally, even though I learned the zero ones first, like the first item is the first item on the list. But just to tell you that um, if you're switching or if you've never heard this before, there are other ways that do it differently. And so having this little piece here just helps you can remember that if I wanted this first one, it's the first item in the list and not the zeroth item in the list. And so just a couple more examples. I can use this code with a colon so 1 colon 20 counts up by 1s, 1 through 20. And that's really handy, as we'll see later when we want to grab maybe columns 4 through 8. Okay, so you don't have to type 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You just type 4 colon 8. Okay. A similar function is called sequence. So seq here. And I'd fill it in. Okay, so I'm calling these functions, and we'll talk a little bit more about functions um, towards the end. But I could say, okay, count from 1 to 20 by 1s. And I get the same answer here, but I could change this by to point 1. And so it'd be 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1.3. And so you can control how it, many of them it prints out. I can, so both of these are, are integer 
vectors. I can create myself a character vector. Cheese is great. I have cheese examples and as many videos as I can make it into. Or I can create a repeating vector, but this is still going to be integers. Now, repeat um, does not require that it be numeric. Sequence does because it's counting, but repeat, I could repeat a bunch of characters as well. So I'm going to repeat a one 30 times. So all of these are vectors and mostly they're the same type. But notice that I can't mix and match. I can't do characters and numbers together. Okay. Now, the class function here just lets me see what it saved them as. So the first one where I counted 1 through 20 is an integer. The third one where I count, said cheese is great is a character. We've already talked about how the penguins data set is what's called a tibble, which for our purposes in this lecture is a data frame. But if I want to look at just one of the columns in that penguins data set, which you'll notice here, it says just penguins here. It has this species thing on the end, and we'll talk about that dollar sign thing later. Um, this shows me just that one column. It's actually a factor. Okay. So factors, remember, are special types of character vectors. Now, one thing I want to note is that um, as we start to play with data and create data, the way that a function acts on data varies. Okay. So functions are these commands that we've been running, things like class, repeat. Okay. And I've tried to type functions in this special console code so that you know that I'm talking about a specific function and not the word class. Okay. So the code that's typed into the parentheses are called the arguments. So every function has a specific set of arguments. And if you want to know what they are, there's a way to look it up. Um, but each particular co function might take different types of, um, of arguments. And so the output will vary based on what you put in it. So there's some really great um, functions in R, like summary, where the output changes based on what you're giving it. So if you give it a vector, it does one thing. If you give it a data frame, it does another thing. So summary is like kind of the workhorse function in R. Okay. So I might use the dim function here to get the dimensions. This will tell me if this is a, an, a, a larger than one, right? So this can't be a vector because it has 344 rows and eight columns. So you always get it as rows, columns. So if I put in the entire data frame, so remember we've decided that penguins is a data frame or a tibble. I said, give me the length of that. You might expect that to return how many rows that is. So when I think about the length of a data frame, I'm also a social scientist, I think about the number of participants in the data set or the number of rows. But that is not what that function does. The length function returns the number of columns. Okay. Now, if I say, okay, give me the length of this specific column, okay, which is a vector, then it returns the number of rows. So the link function varies depending on what it got. If it got a data frame, it's the number of columns. If it got a vector, it's the number of items. So you, know, you gotta play with this to learn this a little bit. And this to me is a, the spot where I can tell you that sometimes the code doesn't give you what you expect and that's not because you typed something wrong, it's because you didn't understand what the code was doing. And so length, here gives us the length and I think it's much clearer if you look at the structure. So let's click over here, right? So the way that it's interpreted the structure is that it's this long. So it's looking at the length of how many names or columns there are. So this is its length, not this way. Okay. So it's thinking about it as columns by rows. So those are vectors. And then a little bit on like how these functions will give us different answers if we have different types of data. So let me talk about a very particularly interesting type of data in R called a list. This is similar to lists in Python, sort of, <laughs> um, in that they can do similar things. But I would say this confuses a lot of people who switch back or tr trying to learn one from the other, um, myself included, when I got started. So vectors are one row of data. And we might want to move up into multiple rows, which is where we're going now. 
Um, so we've already kind of previewed that data frames include multiple rows. Okay. But we might also want to use multiple types. Okay. So this is a this is a, a type of object that will allow us to have multiple value types. So with a vector, it's really key to understand that that vector has to all be the same type. Okay? You cannot have characters and logicals together. You have characters or you have logicals. You don't have both. Okay. With a list, what I can do is start to just put multiple types of variables together. So I can list together a bunch of vectors that have different types. Okay. You can list together a bunch of data frames. So you're not limited to vectors. I don't want to imply that. Um, but I can, a list is essentially like a checklist. <laughs> it's not quite a checklist, but it's this idea of a, like a, a bunch of different things combined together. Okay. And the key thing here that I've got in italics is that these lists can be different links. And that's going to be pretty key because um, in every, almost every other type of object in R, they have to be the same length. So as you start to get multiple rows, those rows have got to be the same size. But in a list, I can have multiple vectors, all different sizes, all different types. So this is where lists are useful. Okay. And uh, many times the output of a function, like let's say here I've got an example of a linear regression, is saved as a list for this reason because there are lots of things that it might that you might want to get back from your regression in the output and it saves them as a list because they're not all the same size. Okay. And they usually have names to help you print out just a portion of that information. So here I ran a linear regression, so I'm just or it's actually very similar to a correlation here of the of the bill length, the length of the bill predicting the flipper length in our penguins. Okay, so how long their beak is basically, does that predict how long their flippers are? And the output for that is saved as a list. It's got coefficients, which is a named number. It has two objects in it. Okay. Um, and then it tells you the attributes here. It has residuals, but that has 342 objects. So now you can see they're different links. Okay. It has effects, rank, fitted values, assigns, QR. QR is actually a list in a list. So you can have this kind of nested recursion structure. And so you can see that there's a lot of data stored here in this list and they're all different links and that's okay. And so then I just printed out one of the options. So you've seen this dollar sign thing a couple of times and we're getting to really what that is and how that's used. Um, but here what we see is I can just give me the coefficients. And so one thing I like about R when you print out the structure of a data frame, or I'm sorry, the structure of an object, it tells you kind of how to call it. So it says use the dollar sign and get the coefficients. Okay. So down here I use the dollar sign and I got just the coefficients back. Which if you haven't taken a statistics course may not mean anything to you, but it's really handy. And so let me now move into dimensional data. So a list is dimensional in a way, but I think most of us think about, um, about data sets kind of like you would Excel, right? Now in Excel, you can actually have different links, but practically most data sets have a number of rows and a number of columns. So we could have what's called a matrix. Okay. So matrices are vectors with dimensions, like a two by three has two rows with three columns. All data must be the same type across the entire matrix. So that is the key to a matrix here. It's the entire matrix must be of the same type, and that can be rather can be fairly limiting. So instead, I could use a data frame, what's called a tibble, okay, which is similar to a matrix, but the columns can be different types. So in our penguins data set that we said is a data frame, one column is a factor, another column is a number. If I convert that into a matrix, it's going to be very unhappy with me um, because it wants them all to be the same type. And that's why I would say matrices are fairly limiting and they're not used uh, in my own work as much because I like things to be of different types. And if I need them to be different links, I go back to a list. So let's look at how we might make a matrix okay, and talk about this square bracket stuff. 
And so I have used the code here to make myself a matrix. So this is a function whose first argument is data. So I put in one through 10 using that colon option that we described earlier. It has five rows and two columns. And then I told it to print out my matrix. So you see a five rows, two columns. And notice these square brackets here. When you get this kind of dimensional data, you have to talk about it as row, comma, column. And so if I want a specific value, let's say the first row, I could write it as my matrix, square brackets, one, comma, nothing, leave that blank. And that shows me just the first row, which would be one and six. If I wanted just the first column, I could type it like this, next to the words my matrix. And so anytime we want maybe the first row and the first column, we do one comma one, and we would just get this number back. And so that's where um, the next lecture we'll talk about subsetting and grabbing just specific values. Now, matrices limiting because I have to have all the same type of data. Let's say instead I want different types of data. Um, and so I didn't build a data frame, I used one that we had built into R here. So I grabbed the penguins data frame. And we can use that same square bracket information because it's still dimensional data. And so let's talk about that up here first. So I told it to rows, give me the first row, comma, columns, give me columns two and three. So it gave me the first row and those two columns. And actually told me a little bit about what they are, factor, and it, it actually lists numeric as double. And so um, that's how I can grab only parts of the data set. So the key is to remember rows, comma, columns. If you leave it blank, that implies that you want all of them. If you put in a, a, a set of numbers, that implies you want those specific columns or specific rows. But we could also do their names. Okay, and you'll see that example later. And these attributes allow us to use this dollar sign. And so you'll see in many lectures, I will talk about uh, data set name, dollar sign, column name because that's usually the structure, but it's also list name, dollar sign, list name. Oh, that came out wrong. Uh, list variable, dollar sign, list section name, so to speak. So we did that a second ago with our coefficients. Oh, it's further away than I thought. So here, this is the name of the variable, and this is the list section we want, as we could see here, right? In a data frame, the dollar sign indicates which column you want. And so what I did was I said, okay, give me penguins, give me the sex column, and then I told it to give me four through 25. Okay, so there's no comma there. Okay. Because we've subset it to only that one column. Okay, we've grabbed just the sex column, and now it's a vector. So if you put a comma in there, you'll get a dimension error. Because you went from having multiple rows and columns to one. And so you only want items four through 25 in that one column. And I really wanted to print this one out so you could see what NAs looked like. And also since it's a factor, it tells me what the two levels are. And so what if I wanna combine data? So let's kind of end this section by talking about um, putting data pieces together. We've already kind of looked at what's called a concatenate or C function which just allows me to create vectors of data by combining like objects. A similar function for multi for dimensional data is rbind, which allows you to row bind or put thing, rows together, and cbind, which allows you to put columns together. I'm gonna mostly talk about code from what's called base R, meaning without installing any extra packages. However, there is a whole world called tidyverse that has similar functions with different types of names. Okay. And it's called, I think it's bind rows and bind columns. Um, I mostly work in base R. You could do either way. Okay. So here I've created two vectors and they're of the same size. Okay. That's key <laughs> because if they're not the same size, it will do funny things. So I can call column bind those together. And you'll see here that I've got a data frame that is um, X and Y 
I didn't save it, I just printed it out with five rows. Or I can use R bind since they're of the same size and um, bind them together. And so I get them now in row format. But the column names are notice, notice they're not there. Okay, so if you make yourself a data frame and don't tell what the column names are, it will column it will naturally assign them v1, v2, v3. Um, so here I can kind of do it either way, but let's say I'm trying to combine two data sets together. There's probably only one direction you can do that. Okay, so if you're combining two data sets, they either have to have the same number of columns in column bind or the same number of rows in row bind. I can do this one either way because they're each a one dimensional array. Okay, so let's end this section here saying, okay, this is sort of the end of the data matrices types section. So you can head on over to this next video. We're gonna keep going in this lecture, um, but I don't wanna definitely wanted to break them up because these can get quite long. So congrats, you've learned a little bit about object types and types of variables. The next lecture will teach you more about um, the inner workings of how to get data into R and what packages and functions are.